ever wonder why or how you ended up in all those places just kind of, you know, by accident? You just happened to end up in these times that stuff was just exploding all around you. A lot of it was accident, yeah. I mean, it was accident that I, uh, went, that we went down to south and, you know, just at a time, just before the civil rights movement exploded. In 1956, I was about to get my Ph.D. from Columbia. I finished my coursework, and I was open for work, especially since I had a wife and two kids, and uh, hadn't looking for a teaching job, and I'd never heard of Spelman College. Uh, I hadn't even thought about black colleges. Uh, in fact, I had sort of told the placement bureau that I would teach anywhere except the South. But they said, this is different, you know, you might be interested in black college, etc. So I met with the president in New York, and he hired me to be chair of the History and Social Science Department at Spelman College. When we got there, things were very quiet and very uh, subdued, and you couldn't tell that anything was going to happen in the South. I didn't come down there to lead in a social movement. You know, I came down there to teach and, and to learn something about the South. And, and so I wasn't uh, saying to my students, let's go out there and break the barriers of segregation, you know, and you all get arrested. <laughs> no, I wasn't doing that. Uh, but, you know, I wasn't a totally passive creature either. That is when, you know, you might say that through some kind of dialogue between me and my students, we made sort of decisions about, oh, well, let's, uh, here we have a social science club. What do we do for a project? Ah, well, how about tackling racial segregation? I came to Spelman in 61. The Atlanta movement was really going pretty strong, and I was very excited and, of course, joined, you know, demonstrations. And part of what made it possible to do that was that he was, he was with us, he was with the students. We were in a, a crisis in the South. We were in a conflict. Uh, we needed every bit of energy we could get and I saw the, the, the college campus as a place where there was a huge amount of intellectual energy and human energy, and I didn't want it to be wasted. So from that point on, I began to see the, the resources of a university, of a college, as something that should not be wasted in merely academic pursuits. I would have never hesitated to go and take students outside and interracial settings to help challenge, whether it's the public library or the state legislature, the segregated seating or the theater. But he was constantly, again, pushing um, to say this is not right and we will challenge that that is not right. We have learned something these past few years about the inadequacy of our regular political structure to bring about desirable social change in a situation of urgency. When people turn in desperation to marches and parades, picketing, sit-ins, mass meetings, and freedom rides, this suggests that the normal channels of government are inadequate for the expression of their grievances and that the mechanism for solution is rusty. He really captured the essence of, you know, of kind of the revolutionary spirit embodied in a professor of history. And that is, is really quite unique, I think. His capacity for moral outrage, which is in much deficit <laughs> today, um, was again a thing that has throughout fed my spirit beats my spirit now. I don't understand how there aren't more people who are just profoundly upset at the racial injustice, at the economic injustice, and having Howard Zinn affirm one's own instincts was an enormously important thing for me as a young black girl um, growing up in the South at that time who had a deep yearning to be free and to challenge the status quo. Um, so did he. And also, of course, in Atlanta, you would never hear any person, black, white, or whatever, uh, expressing the thoughts that he did. And from then on, things were just were never the same. Uh, they weren't never the same in the city of Atlanta. They were never the same for Spelman College, because Spelman College, which had been such a sedate place, such a controlled place, uh, so conservative, so careful, 
And now these students were just humming and uh, seething and their, their long, long pent up indignation at their own lives and their parents' lives, uh, which had been you know, very neatly suppressed in, in the atmosphere of this college um, on a supposition that no, they'd better keep quiet and, and just learn their lessons and, and become important people in the black community. You know, that was all over now. And uh, now they were going to be uh, participants in history. The Southern intellectuals uh, were very supportive of, uh, uh, you know, our version of apartheid. I mean, they didn't object to it. Either they kept quiet, either they openly supported it or they kept quiet. His activism was not at all loved by anybody, hardly. I mean, maybe one or two teachers. When the students came back to the campus after being in jail, after protesting, and then rebelled against the restrictions on campus, against the way they were treated, the way they were patronized by the college administration, and I supported them in that internal struggle. That was too much. He was fired, after all, you know, from Spelman. This guy is bounced out of Spelman College in the most traumatic imaginable circumstances. The Spelman administration waits until after the students have all left campus. That was the key. And then just axed him. Certainly the FBI was already um, putting me on their list. <laughs> The FBI had uh, taken notice of me in 1962 when I delivered a report on the situation in Albany, Georgia for the Southern Regional Council report which made the front page of the New York Times in which my report criticized the FBI and the Justice Department and the federal government for not defending the constitutional rights of black people. And Martin Luther King asked about this, said, yes, I was right that the FBI was really supporting racism in the South. And uh, the FBI took note of my report. Uh, and in fact, it was one of the first times they really took note of King as hostile to the FBI. Uh, so, you know, did the FBI intercede? Did they do anything? Did they talk to the trustees? Did, did I have no way of knowing. This is my favorite place here. It's Dunkin' Donuts, but because it's Harvard, they don't want to call themselves Dunkin' Donuts openly, so they call themselves the Elliott Street Cafe. <laughs> but if you look closely inside, it's Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> it's really funny. But I, I come here all the time, I meet people here all the time, because I love Dunkin' Donuts coffee. <laughs> I wrote two books about the South, actually, and I'd then started to write articles about what was happening in the South around me. You know, living in the black community, what, you know, the swirl of events, the civil rights movement beginning to develop, and so even before the sit ends. And I wrote an article for Harper's Magazine, began writing for The Nation. Then Beacon Press, which is a publisher in Boston, asked if I would write a a history of, about the NAACP and the Southern Movement. And I wrote back to them and I said, you don't understand. The NAACP is not the heart of the Southern Movement. The heart of the Southern Movement, SNCC, this unknown group of young people. And so, okay, I wrote a book about SNCC. SNCC represents the closest thing we have in the United States to that militant mood of change which one finds in emerging nations abroad. It constantly aims to create and recreate, out of the bodies of poor and powerless people, a new force, nonviolent but aggressive, honest and therefore unmanageable. It wants to demonstrate to the nation not what kind of system people should believe in, but how people should live their lives. So its radicalism is not an ideology, but a mood. Moods are harder to define. They are also harder to imprison. 
certainly the, the writing of the book, The New Abolitionist, uh, set a tone. And I think that that might have led us to some degree to, to have that kind of little intellectual edge about us. And so what Howard did was lift us onto the pages of history and uh, really made us conscious that we were involved in a struggle that had historical weight. One of the things that, that comes through when you look at someone like Howard is you recognize that being a historian or being a journalist doesn't relieve you of your other civic responsibilities. I assume that mainstream historians also go and vote, but somehow we find it uh, a little bit more um, challenging when we find out they go out and protest also. I remember uh, in his book uh, when he's talking about the Hattiesburg Freedom Day, and uh, he has a scene in there where he comes into the courtroom. When he gets in there, he finds that some black people have been sitting on the white side, and he's going to sit on the black side. There was an extremely tense moment when the Hattiesburg chief law officer said, now there's a colored side and a white side, and I want all the colored people to move to that side, and the white people to move to the other side. Nobody moves. And then one of the police officers starts moving towards him, and Howard raises his hand. And the judge asks him if he has something to say. And he says that uh, the Supreme Court has ruled that it's illegal to segregate in any courtroom in the United States. And would you mind uh, following the law of the Supreme Court? And it was one of those marvelous moments when authority and, and tradition of, of a bad kind is challenged and just because of firmness and willingness to risk what could have been a bloodbath, you know, in the wrong hands, um, there was at least that, that moment of change. Democracy is not just a counting up of votes. It is a counting up of actions. Without those on the bottom acting out their desires for justice as the government acts out its needs and those with power and privilege act out theirs, the scales of democracy will be off. That is why civil disobedience is not just to be tolerated. If we are to have a truly democratic society, it is a necessity. What's interesting to me is that both Stott and Lynn and Howard Zinn the only white professors that I remember who joined the Civil Rights Movement and taught in black colleges were also uh, the first to go with me to North Vietnam. In Southeast Asia, we want nothing more and nothing less than the assured and guaranteed independence of the peoples of that area. We are in Southeast Asia to help our friends preserve their own opportunity to be free of imported terror of alien assassination managed by the North Vietnam communists based in Hanoi and backed by the Chinese communists from Peking. Telling the truth, a truth that the president doesn't want told, can be very powerful. You have the chance, if you know a truth that politicians are trying to conceal, you have the chance just by telling it um, effectively to save a great many lives, and that's a power that you don't have every day. Now this was in the beginning of 68. The Tet Offensive is on in Vietnam, and there's a sudden uprising of, of uh, rebellion, uh, Viet Cong, a, a National Liberation Front, all over South Vietnam. And while I'm teaching my seminar, somebody comes in to the seminar and uh, says to me, I have a telephone call for you. So I, I told the class to wait and, <laughs> and uh, I went out and, and there was Dave Dellinger on the other end of the line and says, well, uh, you know, the North Vietnamese have decided that uh, as a gesture at the time of the Tet, the Tet holiday in Vietnam, they want to release the first three airmen. I said, well, uh, okay, when? tomorrow morning. <laughs> that was it. I packed my bag and the next morning I was in an apartment in Greenwich Village uh, meeting Dave Dellinger, Tom Hayden, uh, and for the first time Dan Berrigan. And we 
um, hopped on a plane that day and flew halfway around the world. What indications from North Vietnam have you had that you'll be able to pick these men up? Well, the uh, sole thing that I'm aware of was a telegram sent from uh, Hanoi and arriving, I believe, when was it Sunday? And it uh, was addressed to Dave Dellinger, the American Peace Movement, and it said that the North Vietnamese were prepared to release three American airmen uh, if the peace movement would send a representative to Hanoi. So you expect to get the men or have the men released to your custody in Hanoi, not here? That's what we expect, yeah. It was, you know, the other side of the moon for both of us. The Tet uprising had occurred in South Vietnam, in, in uh, Saigon, and everything was frozen, including ourselves. Remember, they even got into the embassy, they took over the American embassy in Saigon. It was a very frightening thing for uh, the American establishment and the American public. And, uh, and so we, uh, Dan Bergen and I spent a week in Vientiane uh, before the plane finally was able to get out of Saigon, come to uh, Vientiane and Laos and take us uh, on a strange trip through the night to Hanoi. We were in night shelter, bomb shelters in the hotel practically every night. Um, we toured the, the, the shelters of the city. Uh, practically all children had been evacuated. Well, we saw Hanoi under siege and war, and we uh, experienced bombings every day in Hanoi. And this is my first time on the receiving end uh, it was a sobering experience to feel what it was like uh, being bombed rather than bombing. Then one day suddenly, all these things happened suddenly, we were brought into, unexpectedly, into a big hall, into this blinding light, into this international forest of cameras and of news people, and they paraded the, the three airmen into the room, still in their prison uniform. We had had an agreement with the White House that they would be in our custody back to New York and that that would be honored. We landed in Vientiane. <laughs> Aboard came this unspeakable character, uh, Robert uh, Sullivan, ambassador to Laos. They will fly in the air attaché's aircraft to Udon, remain overnight there, returned by expeditious, most expeditious means to the United States. The representatives of the embassy here in Vientiane, while talking about free choice for the pilots, uh, made it clear that the United States preferred that they go back by military plane. Major, you were in the plane there for about 40, 45 minutes. Um, what was the discussion all about? Is there... I'm not at liberty to discuss that. Not only did the North Vietnamese make it clear to us that this question of the pilots going home by a non-military plane was important, but they made it clear to the pilots. And I recall that when we suggested that uh, the people in Washington making this decision had not been to North Vietnam, uh, recently or not recently, uh, they had not talked with the North Vietnamese, and that perhaps we and the pilots knew something about the North Vietnamese attitude which they did not know. Whereupon the ambassador uh, came back with, I thought, a, a marvelous answer. He said that one of the persons in Washington making this decision uh, was uh, a man who had survived a Japanese prison camp and had come out of it weighing 97 pounds, period. At which point, Father Berrigan said, these men don't weigh 97 pounds, I don't see the analogy. In fact, Father Berrigan and I, on our way back, this may be, seem presumptuous on our part, but when, on our way back in, from Paris, we sent a wire, I think with our last 15 bucks, to the White House, saying something like, uh, we'd like to talk to you, President Johnson, you know, would you please meet with us? Uh, we just come back from Hanoi, we just talked with the Premier Pham Van Dong, we just read in the newspaper that you say the North Vietnamese uh, are not ready to negotiate. Uh, what we uh, learned from Pham Van Dong uh, seems to contradict that. Uh, we'd like to talk with you about this and about the prisoner release, which we think has been mishandled, but uh, we have not 
so far received an answer from LBJ. Uh, At this day. <laughs> uh, yeah. I know many people have said, look, we've killed innocent people. Our bombs have killed civilians and babies and mothers. And I suppose there is truth to that. There have been people that have been <clears throat> killed. But your government has not bombed civilians. Your government has not bombed open cities. Your government has sent its bombers in after targets, military targets that have been placed in an area surrounded by civilians. I was in North Vietnam during the war and I saw the effects of these cluster bombs on, on little kids and little, uh, little round bombs that contain hundreds and hundreds of steel pellets and when the bomb explodes these pellets shoot out and they enter the bodies of people and almost all civilians just farmers and their families and uh, and then they're very very hard surgically to get out One of the strangest things that happened was we were very interested in knowing how the v Vietnamese withstood this bombing. And so far to the north of Hanoi, they took us to a, a mountain that had caves in it where they had fought against the Chinese and the Japanese and the French before the Americans. And it was like an underground world, uh, kind of the kind of thing that you would see in a Star Wars movie now. And so we, we had a dinner and a meeting in this cave it was the size of a basketball auditorium and and then the thing that the Vietnamese always do is they they all get up and sing songs about their struggle or traditional songs of the country and then whether you can sing or not they ask you to stand up and sing so Howard sang America the Beautiful great pieces of nonsense which the administration keeps uttering and which any student of international affairs I think can demolish in a very short time. How did Vietnam fall? If Vietnam is about to fall, did it fall because of something that came from abroad? It fell because of internal conditions or it's falling because of internal conditions in Vietnam. The best way to make sure that a country turns to communism is to put foreign military forces in it because then the communists will have a nationalist cause which they can use against the foreign power. And when his book came out, I think 1966 or so, uh, there wasn't a, you know, it was so inconsistent with the drift of thinking and understanding that people, most people couldn't even read it, they couldn't read the words. Vietnam, it seems, has become a theater of the absurd. Early in 1966, a new pacification technique was developed by American soldiers. It involved surrounding a village, killing as many young men as could be found, and then taking away the women and children by helicopter. The Americans called this procedure Operation County Fair. I was very conscious of uh the role of the historian and how um, a historian who didn't use his, her knowledge to play some role in, in what was the most serious issue before the nation was somebody who was neglecting his or her duty to education, to students. My first encounter with Howard was literally my first day as a freshman at BU. 
Uh, I arrived there and almost immediately hundreds of students, you know, swarmed into the Marsh Chapel uh, and provided a sanctuary for a soldier who had gone AWOL from a military base near Boston. He'd been given orders to ship out to Vietnam. He came to BU and, you know, was immediately supported by people there. It was a 24-hour day, you know, teaching, really. It was music, people bringing in food, people speaking around the clock. And Howard probably spoke a half a dozen times during that week, and it was very inspiring to me. I mean, he was spellbinding and making connections between the war and civil disobedience, the history of war during the 20th century, his own experience as a bombing pilot in World War II. Um, and it just, I'd never seen anything like it before. Students were expected to be quiet and live in the dormitory and, uh, you know, be supported by mom and dad and take classes and do as they're told. You know. Then along came the 60s and people like Zen and, and uh, the, the students of my generation. And all of a sudden we were getting involved in issues right there on the campus that had been, been considered outside of our purview completely. That's what they mean when they say the 60s ruined education. <laughs> that, that is, there, there was this incredible life that suddenly came into the universities as the world entered the university and the university entered the world. Eventually, Boston University did become a, a hot point of um, student protest against the war. And the hotter it got, the more we depended on, on um, Howard Zinn to support us, because while other faculty members thought that sometimes we'd gone too far, uh, Zinn was always right there indeed, backing us up and, and giving us the intellectual uh, uh, justification for our points of view. So now this guy is trying to get tenure at Boston University. <clears throat> and looks like I think he didn't get it one time and this is a second time around. All it needs is the vote of the trustees. <laughs> so the students come to him and ask him to speak against the war and he doesn't really connect the two things. He said, well, sure, because if you were in Howard's position, or you always said sure. And then it gets a little closer and you say, uh, well, where is this going to be? And they say, well, right outside the such and such hotel because we're trying to speak to the trustees and it begins to dawn on, oh, now wait a minute, these are the same trustees that on that same day are going to be voting on my tenure. And then he says, and uh, who else will be speaking? Oh, you're the only one. <laughs> And he says, yes, yes, I'll speak. And by the time he speaks, the trustees have voted. Hello. Thank you, everyone, for sticking around. Um, I am going to bring on our moderator and filmmakers, um, Deb Ellis and Dennis Mueller and Jordana Dim. So let me bring them on. I think you're muted. Well, <laughs> um, this is our life on Zoom, always these technical difficulties, but um, while Jordana's getting that set, I think we can just maybe start talking about how, what drew you to this project and how you got involved and um, how it, it came to happen. Oh, that's a long story. Um, I think Dennis was actually the one who got this project started initially, and then he came to me. So I'll let him talk a little bit about the beginning, how it started. It's kind of a nice story. I was driving along somewhere in um, Southern Illinois, right? And I heard this somewhat sounded like an angry voice, but it was from Howard Sin, and I had read the people's history, so I knew who he was. You're listening to it on the radio. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The yeah. voice wasn't just emanating from anywhere. Yeah, and I'm listening to the radio and I go, that's Howard Sin. I don't know what the program was. And it was during that program, I thought, someone should make a film about him. And from that point on, I called up Howard Holt and said, um, it's very unfair conversation because um, I know you and you don't know who me at all. 
So why don't I send some work that I did and something I did with Deb? And if you want to, you know, work with us in that, you know, we love it. Actually, it was just me at the time. If you want to work with it, it, do it. And that's how we started. And he just, um, I went to um, the scene that you saw shot there on um, his office, right, in BU. And he said, let's do it. And, um, you know, became, you know, this is still going on. Beautiful scene. Great. Can you actually um, hear me now? I can. Yes. Yes. Great. So sorry about that. Life is a little confusing um, where I am. Um, I am thrilled to be able to be here and I apologize for the, the technical snafus. Um, and it was a pleasure to work a while ago with Deb and um, Dennis's uh, as they were working on the archival side of their film. And I'm, I'm curious um, what you're most proud of of this project that started so long ago um, and what you might have done differently as, as storytellers if you were working now on um, this story. What, what really resonates with you is that was the perfect thing to do or what might you do now 20 years later when some of those people you interviewed might not be available <laughs> uh, for those conversations. The only one I could think of, and we really tried to uh, do it, and it just didn't work out. We wanted to speak to uh, uh, Jeff as a son, or, and at, the only thing, asked a question, and his daughter too, asked a question of, what was it like to have the civil rights movement in your living room? Because I just thought that that would be a really kind of personal kind of answer and all that. But for myself, that's the only thing I think that I could have done any better, given what we knew at that time, and given what um, knowledge that we knew. Um, I'm not sure that we could have done it differently to have made it better. It, it, I mean, the one thing that I've always wished, and you know, there's there's stuff that you just can't get to when you're making a film. You can't do everything. I always wish that his wife Rosalind was more a part of it. But I also remember being told by his daughter once. Um, I think I said something very optimistic that, you know, filmmakers love to say, we want to see the true Howard. And she looked at me and said, good luck. <laughs> so I think what you get, no matter what you're doing, when you are um, documenting, especially a, you know, a person who's a public figure, is there's a certain element of what they reveal publicly. And Howard was very good at that. He really learned how to tell a story and to tell a story that he felt that is very, very important. And so sometimes it, there are little moments in the film that are so lovely where he sort of breaks that. And, and those to me are the little magic moments. Um, but, you know, this wasn't an expose of Howard by any means. It was really using um, you know, his participation in these key moments of uh, history and social movements throughout the 20th, 20th century to tell the story of, of the 20th century. Um, so using his life as a way to tell that story. And the one thing I do take from it uh, to this day, and I still tell people it's hard nowadays, but the power, uh, the lonesome person is not powerless, you know? We are not powerless. And as Howard looked at it when he talked about the film, it was kind of funny. And we, I felt really proud. And he was kidding around. He has such a great sense of humor saying that, I don't think you had enough of me. <laughs> and then he would go, oh, of course not, of course not. And, and, and then say, you know, the real story of this, the person is not powerless. And and that made or me, the individual is not powerless. Yeah, it was how it's he really said. about the individual is not powerless and giving hope okay. to people. I think was so lovely. Um, you know, there's there's one little spot. This doesn't quite answer your question, but I've always loved it. And whenever I see this spot in the film, I, I reflect on it. There's um, the spot where it, they're talking about when his trip to North Vietnam, and he sang. Oh yes, what did he sing? The National Star Spangled Banner. He sang um, America, America the Beautiful. Beautiful. I'm Tom sorry. Tom Hayden. You, Go ahead. Tom Hayden 
says, well, I think, and he tells the whole scene and how the Vietnamese would sing their songs and at dinner and go there and Howard sang up and said, America the Beautiful. So we were thought, oh, this is great. We can juxtapose the images. It's like- a, you Make know. this ironic little place. Yeah. When Howard saw the film at, at, its, at its premiere, Full House, all of that, when we're walking out, he goes, you know, I don't really think I sang that, did I? And his wife said, it works in the movie. <laughs> yeah. So there are little bits and pieces of history like that too, you know, that that happen when you make a film, when you tell a story, that that, you know, that story that's in this film may be the way that some people remember this incident. And he I'm wasn't sure it happened. Roz thought it made a good, a good story. <laughs> <laughs> and memory, you know, memories change. Yeah. And how we remember things. Uh, Tom remembered that. Howard remembered that. Who was really, I don't know. <laughs> um, so uh, we have a question from the audience. Uh, when was the film produced? And the answer is no, this isn't the complete film. This is about half of it. I think that we just watched about 30 minutes. About a third of it. of it. Yeah. A third of about it. A yeah. A third of the film. So the film takes place over the course of Howard's life. So from really his, his early life and his, his uh, growing up uh, in, in New York um, to um, at, just after 9-11, uh, where he sort of reemerged as a spoke spokesperson for people who were looking for answers. We started making the film in 2007. We finished it in 2004. Um, 97. I'm sorry. We started it in 1997. Unless you're living backwards. 2004. History has a funny way of doing things. Um, <laughs> um, and, you know, so it took us a long time to make the film. Um, and that's uh, that's something that has worked in our favor and in many of our films because things sort of emerge when you're making a film. For us, we had the structure of this film probably before 9-11. And uh, Ironically, 9-11 was, ended up giving us a, an ending. I mean, and it's, it's, it's sad, but that's true. And it yeah. made it very dramatic. And I, I see Judy's like there, and I remember something Jerry Blumenthal has said, and, and, and very true about for filmmakers, for young filmmakers there too. If you wait long enough, <laughs> something will happen. <laughs> And I thought that was one of the wisest things about filmmaking I ever heard. I'm doing a film right now about Russell Banks. And because we waited everywhere in COVID everything, some person drops the beginning and ending of the film. So if you wait long enough, something really <laughs> can happen. So speaking of waiting, some of what, what um, you might have waited for um is access to some of those amazing people you interviewed. I mean, who, who, how did Howard Zinn know that, you know, his students at Spelman would include Alice Walker? Um, it, it's kind of an a, amazing group of people who you are in Staunton Lind, all these people who are willing to speak up. Um, were there any challenges or particular successes in those interviews or things that you, um, I know my students worked, they were mostly at least an hour long. And they were fairly extensive, of which you maybe chose one or two minutes for the film. Um, were, there, were there things that you really regretted not including? Were there things that were um, difficult and amazing uh, that you got? Like what, any any tidbits from the challenges of, of working with interviewers to get your story? So we were super lucky with this film. It's not normal that when you make a film and you call people up and ask them if you will if if they'll do an interview with you that that they yeah, automatically yeah. say yes and I think that that was one of the places Howard did not help us with any of these interviews in the sense that he 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 was a good teacher and he forced us to make our own connections with all of these people so he wasn't calling up anybody and saying oh please do an interview with these poor no, broke filmmakers but whenever we finally you know sort of cut through the the uh, the wires and got to these people, they all said yes, which was amazing. Um, one of my biggest memories of this time um, of doing all of those interviews was my son sitting underneath the tables of most of those people uh, while we were doing the interviews and occasionally bothering them, but somehow we got through it all. <laughs> 
So that was probably the hardest part of doing most of those interviews. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've got a, can I add something to that? Sure. Uh, you guys, <clears throat> having worked on a shot for you guys, and thank you for that opportunity. I know everybody focuses on kind of like the political superstars, um, which, I mean, they were great to film. But one of the most moving parts was when he spoke to kids in West Town here in Chicago and the relationship between this old, old man and these teenagers in West Town and what gets revealed there, I think, is, is, um, is really important. And unfortunately, we concentrate on, like, the stars. But and that scene always just blew me away. Well, the interesting thing is how, as I mentioned about, you know, the Jerry quote was that, yes, that happens in lots of ways. We didn't know how an ending would be, even at the time. We're kind of struggling, struggling. When 9-11 comes, it was like we immediately know that's our third act. He's not an artifact anymore of the past talking about him. No, he's out there doing what he always did his whole life. So Going to there, I had done a thing about COINTELPRO, Deb and I did it, the FBI's war on Black America, so they all liked us for doing the FBI's war, so they opened, I told them about Zinn and to start it, and they were just delighted, goes, of course we will, thank you, thank you, we remember you, uh, because they were, because of the Puerto Rican political prisoners, so they were in support of the uh, Geronimo Pratt and the Panthers from back into another film. You're talking about the high school that allowed. Yeah, we're talking there. about the high school going on, and they were all from that high school. So that was an important scene in what you're saying. And then Deb gets them at the um, going through Boston Common and the demonstration and following that. So it, it became present tense, which is kind of perfect, right? If you're doing a bio of some time, and then um, all of a sudden the third fact is present tense we're in the world now you know so yeah. when you mentioned that it made me think about it a lot it helped put the whole film together yeah and thanks judy for that yeah um i'll have one I, more question oh, oh go ahead sorry can go i ahead. interrupt am i uh interrupting the process um hi uh coming coming to you live from media burn hq um i felt uh i don't usually talk during these things but um I, my mom was, uh, had the honor of being one of the last classes that Howard taught at BU when she was there as an undergraduate. And um, actually for that reason, I don't remember what age I was, pretty young, but she uh, gifted me for one Christmas, the graphic novel adaptation of a people's history. Um, and I remember getting it at the time and reading it and feeling really uncomfortable while I was reading it. Like it wasn't something I was supposed to be reading um <clears throat> which i think was like uh kind of the the best reaction i could have had to it at that young age and i'm i'm thinking of this while while watching this footage um and uh thinking about you know the the clip that we saw and this is kind of building off of judy a little bit like covered a lot of the ways this was impacting uh college level students but um i guess i'm thinking more now about the way that his work has so impacted like primary education in the US and specifically right now, the sort of battlegrounds that are being drawn in conservative states over censorship and sort of access to materials that are con considered radical. Um, and I'm maybe my question is a little bit too open-ended, but um, as these things are always living documents, I'm wondering if you can speak to the ways in which Howard's work sort of coalesces with what's what's going on right now um in i guess in like with younger people in younger schools right now there's a um, project called the zen education project that has created a lot of educational materials around howard's work and has also distributed this film and other materials and his books uh throughout the country to thousands and thousands and thousands yeah. of schools um, so that's one way and one place that it continues to 
find its way into schools. I teach um, college level and I often have students who were introduced to the people's history um, in high school. Um, so there are still people out there, despite you know what's going on in education, who are using his work as 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 an entry point into uh, some critical thinking about uh, what's going on in our country. The only thing I can add, because I'm not teaching right now, is the anecdote that you were telling about your mother, is that on the last class, and this is for students and classes now, and how do you relate to now education? I remember reading something that when he was retiring, taking his own class, might have been your mom, taking your own class from the class to go to a demonstration. I believe it was over nurses on strike, something like that. And, and it, he wanted to do that because he wanted to show the, the melch of education and practical and the taking as he said, taking the classroom out to the real world. So it was interesting when you were telling me that your mom who must have been his last class, she might have been on that last march with him. Are there any other folks who'd like to ask questions? I'll just open it up now and then if not, I can always ask more. And we'll certainly respond to anything that anybody asks. Yeah, us. we're we're open for any answer. I'll ask a question. It's kind of like okay, an interviewer of you guys. Um, so Matt Damon, we're. I mean, I know the answers. You made this on no money, on your credit cards, and you got Matt Damon to read from Howard's writings. Um, how did that happen? Oh, it was great. Um, that was the first time we ever asked Howard for help. That was right. We, he didn't help us. We lied a little bit. At this time, we were like, Howard, how do we reach Matt? And how Matt, do we, it, it, we did know that Matt's mother, Matt had grown up in the same housing complex uh, as, as uh, the, the next door. Next so door. we knew. So we knew. They were friends with his mother. We, we, we knew that. And we knew that, um, you know, from um, the movie. Where he mentions the the book with uh, um, oh you got a bunch of books you don't have the right books you know to um, Robin Williams okay so it was just at that time to ask for some help I don't know how to get in touch with how do we how do we reach Matt uh, uh, Matt and he says that was uh, Dead Poet Society right yeah no 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 it was um the no. one with Ben Affleck good 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 good. Goodwill hunting. Good will hunting. Good will hunting. Good will hunting. Good will hunting. I get them. Control. Yeah, when he goes to a psychiatrist, and it's and it, and 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 actually, um, and he demanded to to mention Howard. Yeah. Yeah, he yeah. did. But anyways, how did we get Matt? Well, that's how we got him. It was because um, we, I can't re reach him, so we gave him the number. He says, "Don't tell nobody." And I was like, "He's gonna know where it, who it comes from, right? <laughs> you know, how else do I get it?" And his um, aide was real nice. Um, I forget her what her name was, but she set the whole thing up. And I'll tell you, we called up. Um, she got in touch with Matt Damon. We got in touch with him, and uh, asked for money to finish right we got a thing back in one day and in one day a thing I, back but which means some money yeah he helped fund the finishing of the film as well yeah which was really super generous i mean i think a lot of people thought we would never finish this film um in fact somebody who knew howard told me once that he had told that had, he had had a conversation with howard and howard was really concerned um whether the film would ever get finished and uh was that because you guys were slow to get the interviews done or no we were slow editing? to get it done period because it there there are Funding. costs that you incur at the, at the end someone else another filmmaker a very well-known filmmaker who had um you know the means really to probably go in and and do interviews also try asked howard if um for rights to to do his story and that was after we were three or four years in and that was what's her name? It doesn't oh, matter. It was Barbara, it was Barbara, Barbara Koppel's Koppel. assistant. And uh, Howard, what I remember going down there and eating down to their house, and I remember sitting around and eating turkey and cranberry 
uh, saw sandwiches. It must have been right around Thanksgiving. And uh, Howard asking us what what uh, you know what did we think of that? And we were sort of like you know felt defeated for a minute, and you know expressed to him how much work we had done. Um, and I think Howard might have been wondering whether we would ever get it done. But anyways, he he was generous enough to allow us to to finish the film, and I think that that speaks so highly of him in the long run because you know Barbara Koppel. <laughs> Barbara Koppel is, yeah. is, is, is a big filmmaker. Yeah, it was an interesting story. So uh, later on at um, something in Chicago, I believe it was, because I was visiting there and I ran into uh, Barbara and I mentioned I kind of sheep and going because she was like my hero and I'm like looking down and, oh, oh, and glad to meet you and mentioned it and she loved the movie. Said, oh, I saw that. You really captured it and all that. And it was like, I made it, you know, feel pretty good, pretty good, actually. Great. You know? We have a question in writing asking um, when the archival footage came in and the scripting. Where, where did you and how did you integrate that into the into the storytelling? Oh, uh, how, how integrated it? How did you find the archival footage? How did how did we make decisions about how to integrate it? Well, the oh, oh, okay. Um, Deb served as the editor in most of it, and, and I worked film research, right? So I had a good memory of all that. So could find it from there and um, knowing where things came from. Um, I spent a lot of time in the National Archives, so I knew what was there. You know, I would spend years basically at the National Archive, you know, for MPI and all those. And archives back then were not digitized like they are today. No. They were not digitally no. accessible. You couldn't just like type in a keyword. You really had to work through and, and go to the archives. And... Three by five cards. Right. Remember, remember <laughs> that three by five cards? You yeah. know, so it, it went through all that and, and found it. And the thing to remember for students always, someone who searches for footage, I even do it today is looking for how do you find good footage that that's useful and all that. Sometimes look for things that have nothing to do with what you're looking for. You know, um, it, there might be a scene of, say, Chicago. In Algren, there was a scene of we were looking at signs uh, from handy signs. And all of a sudden, I saw signs from the exact same subway with the L train from the right year, because I'm a Chicago and I know what years they were from. That wasn't about finding streetcar footage, not at all. That was under a thing about signs, painting signs. So to young students, when you're looking for footage, um, look everywhere, because you mm -hmm. never know what you're going to see. Just, that, just kind of look, go through it. You're just looking for images, that's all. One of the things that, Interest to, interests me about the archival footage that we use in this film is is none of it is directly related to Howard or Howard's life. So it's all archival footage that's used to give a sensibility about a period of time. And it, 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 there's you know there are various ways and ethics about using footage. I suppose I, I think that it's pretty clear that that's what we're doing in this film, but. Uh, there are, and since you were so low budget, how were you able to acquire so much footage? Was it in the public domain? Were you looking at PBS? I mean, how how did you get some so of much? it was? Yeah, some of it was in public domain. So, um, but some of it, you know, the news footage that we have, we yeah. paid we paid a lot of money for for that time. I mean, today we might have been able to use some of that footage using fair use claims, um, which is a whole argument about how you can use archival footage in uh, films, particularly historical films, um, that didn't that the argue, the legal argument for using uh, footage using fair use didn't exist when we were making this film. Yeah, and I think we licensed, you know, the footage we licensed were just the re regular stuff, all NBC, CBS, um, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. Some like, you won't tell me where that I might have stolen that no one knew it was because I worked for a place and they steal the footage anyway so I knew it wasn't theirs <laughs> that's the, that's the little secret for people at archives they steal everything so what you do <laughs> is if you see something that's stolen look back for when it was 
where, in, where, where, where it was from. from. And you'll find out, oh, that's in public domain. It's in public domain. It's like whoever will nicely sell you for $60 a minute of the Red Scare in Chicago or 1919 and tell you that. And then you go, no, it's not anymore. You don't own it. It's public domain. It's been 100 years, man. Whoever shows it. Yeah. So I was aware of what the laws were of that, even with knowing what first. Uh, what I'm explaining, I'm sorry. I lost my train. No worries. Um, we're close to eight o'clock, so I will ask one more question. And then, Sarah, if you want to let me know what we do next. Well, also, just Myla Cabot Zinn has had her hand up for a while. Uh, oh, absolutely. Oh, yes. let's, let's let her speak. So sorry. Please click on the camera again. Oh, hi. Hi. I don't have a question, but I thought this is my chance to thank you both because I had watched the film originally and loved it, but I just saw it recently and was just absolutely, I've never used this expression, gobsmacked. Oh, <laughs> it, just, God. It, was, it was so beautifully done, so moving. And the way you capture all those important periods of history that he, as you're so right, he was, a, he was able to be a part of because it was, I mean, it's pretty incredible to have been in those places in those times. But I love the way you use the still photographs. You, you got away with really giving a sense of it all. Um, and also, I thought the interviews were fantastic. <laughs> the way you edited it and that thing, the way, you, and even this piece to tonight, the way you ended it with what Stoughton said, it was just really beautiful. So thank you both for, I, I mean, I can imagine all the work that went into it and all the love that went into it. And it's, but it's, it's, it's really, it's really visible. So thank you. Thank you, Milo. That's really important. Thank you. Yeah. To hear. Really lovely. Yeah. yeah. And you know, you can never, as you know, you can never capture a full life or a full biography of anything. And nor do I want to make a film to the minutiae of details. But you know, making a, a little small comment was the important thing is to just get the right feel of it. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's very inspirational. I think it's inspirational for people now. We really need that. Yeah. So it's so important that you captured all of that, put it together, and now we have it. And when we need inspiration and cur and encouragement, there it is. So, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Thank you. And I'm happy you mentioned Zen Education Project because they're doing such incredible work. And that's his legacy is living on through all of the work of teachers and historians and librarians all over the country. So that was so important that you said that. So now I will bow out. I just wanted to thank you. Thanks, Maya. Thanks. Good to see you. Thank you. See you too. So my last question, and then I'll turn it back over to Sarah. Um, was really exactly along the lines that uh, Milo was talking about. Um, this is a film that is in so many ways about student and faculty activism. So if you had a hope for today, what would you hope that students and faculty can take away? I think in some ways, Dennis answered that, right? It's not individuals can make a difference, but um, thinking back on all of those stories that you told in, in this moment, how does that's that a great question. Um, I mean, I I personally feel like I'm seeing a lot more activism going on in uh, schools and among young people today, and maybe not led so much. Well, actually, led by fa led with faculty. I, I'm not going to say by faculty. Um, so I think that that is encouraging to me, and I think that maybe you know. We're still happy to show this film anywhere. It's widely available. <laughs> and I, I think maybe, you know, maybe it's time for another push out there, huh? Yeah. But it's to me, it's so, it's so active, it's so engaging to see students who are really feeling, you know, it, it, it often often instigated by climate, but you know, they're scared and they're moving now. And that's that's lovely. You know what I think of mm -hmm. is I of when you know depressed of the scenes that's it is right now and all that there's no hope there's like and i i end up saying it too 
is just to think about it a little bit and realize so what you know what Howard said about the individual is not powerless. The fact that you know a change starts very small. Three people around where there's a rainstorm, as Howard would stay, and there is, and you're sitting there and you're getting wet and going, nothing can possibly happen out of this. Uh, how do you know? You know, so to hang in there, yes. Yeah, both uh, Dennis and Deb, <clears throat> the film in some ways has been buried. I know it got first got sold to Sundance. Um, and I know it's available on uh, Amazon, stuff like that. I think it's time for a push to, um, to re-energize the exhibition um, and distribution end of this film, because it's so deeply relevant today. I was going to say, maybe it's the moment for that. Yeah. And sometimes we need people from the outside to, to remind us of that. So thank you. Yeah, because you're lost in your own thing and whatever you're doing. Yeah, I mean, I just, I just, um, I was on the phone with Jill Gabelo, this filmmaker. Yeah. Who was talking about Howard Zinn. And I told her about this film. She never heard of it. She went on to Amazon, ordered it, and was blown away by it. So it's like, really? Wow. There's so many people who don't know about this. Well, you can tell Jill that. I had my students do her close close uh, readings of films this this uh, semester, and tell her as she suggests. Far, and I used to show "Far from Poland" to my <laughs> class. Who the okay, well, we can talk about that some other yeah. time. Yeah, but tell her that. But thank you. It, I so, will. Thank you, Judy. And I think thank you. That's a great to reminder. Push on this film and get it out there again, yeah. particularly given the climate and on college campuses. Yeah. Um. They need to know about this. Yep. Thank you. I, I, thank you. Well, it's and actually just nice as a faculty member to say that it's it's a film that says the faculty can be allies, not the enemy, right? And I think for, for me as a faculty member, as well as somebody who is just also blown away by the film and had the privilege of having my students work with your archival footage, um, having them think along with those speakers and, and find parallels in their own lives back in 2019, I think, when we did this. Um, it's a moment where faculty sometimes feel like they're not perceived of as part of the solution. And, and if there's something hopeful in that angle of storytelling as well, Zinn being exceptional as he was. Um, but it's, it, that's very positive and hurting. Sarah, can I turn this back over to you? Yes, you can. Um, so I love this discussion. This was so wonderful for here, talking with you all tonight, hearing all this stuff, revisiting this film. Um, as I put in the chat, um, we don't have the edit on mediaburn.org, but we have all 100 hours of the raw footage. So you can watch much, much more than is in the film. Um, if you're interested in following any particular topic through any, you know, any appearance he made, you can watch the whole thing. Any interview, you can watch the whole thing. Um, that's all for free on mediaburn.org. Um, and yeah, thank you all for joining us. Um, we're going to take a little hiatus on these virtual talks until um, January 5th, when we're going to have the activist filmmaker Eddie Becker showing the um, footage he shot um, at the January 6th uh, event. Um, event. <laughs> <laughs> I had to realize I was unprepared to select the word I'd like to use there. But um, yeah, so we'll be back on January 5th and we will have a whole season full of more events like this. So we hope to see you all there. Um, thanks to uh, Deb and Dennis uh, for joining us and for, to Jordana for moderating. Um, it was a great. So thank you all um, and good night. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. It's a great archive and look for people. It's the history of the 60s and 70s are in those interviews. There's a huge amount of amazing information in there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you guys.